Is that right, Rach? Could you give me a thumbs up if, you've, if everybody's got that? Yeah, I can see that. Good. Right, in that case, welcome to new introductions. Um, yeah, must be a few new faces today. I will introduce myself, Trevor Clements, um, Head of Business Development at Hertfordshire Building Control, um, grand title for a techie bloke, really. Um, uh, this is this is my sort of thing, uh, the technical side of building control. And uh, today I'm joined by our major projects manager, Les Ryder. Um, fortunately, Les knows quite a lot about minor projects as well, uh, as you'll find out later. So summary of the scope, we're going to do a very quick bit on the legislation, because that's quite a dry topic, as we all know. And then it'll be open to Les, who's going to cover some of the structural um, compliance uh, aspects that we come across. And... Um, after that, I'll cover, I'll cover the big topic of fire safety, where there are very onerous compliance issues um, to deal with. And after that, we'll jointly cover a few other sections of interest that have particular relevance to both conversions. So as you've probably seen, you're all on mute for obvious reasons, um, in that there's so many people out there we'd, we'd get background noise otherwise. So if you could, we could ask you to stay on mute. Um, uh, and if, if we start getting background, we'll have to just put everyone on mute again and, and, and get going again. Any questions? We, again, we've got a lot to get through, so um, we'll do those at the end. So if you could put those on chat, um, and uh, yeah, whatever time available, we'll, we'll, we'll try and deal with those. And any we don't get to deal with, we will deal with in, in a, an email to all, all the people who attend. Um, right, so without further ado, let us get cracking and uh, I see I've set my screen up so I can't get at my side button. That's better. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just adjusting. Right. So the basis for controlling loft conversions, of course, it's the building regulations 2010, and they're controlled as partly as a material alteration under regulation three, and as a material change of use under regulation five. A material alteration to a building, as many of you will know, is one that results in it not complying with what are termed the relevant requirements of building regulations, where previously it did, or being more unsatisfactorily in relation to those relevant requirements. What are the relevant requirements? Well, they're part A, most of part B, by structure, most of part B, by safety, and part M, accessibility. Um, a material change of use is where there is a change in the purposes for which, or the, or the circumstances in which a building or part of a building, so not that can be a, a part of a building, as in loft conversions. There's a change in how it's used so that after the change, the building is used as a dwelling where previously it was not. So that's how we control loft conversions and building regulations. That's what we control, uh, that's why we control, this is what we control. But A, structure B for our safety, C, resistance to moisture, E, resistance passage of sound, part F, ventilation, sanitation, drainage, heat producing appliances, conservation of fuel and power, and electrical safety. Of course, some of those may not have relevance to the particular conversion, but, but we have the, the power in the regulations to, uh, to deal with them. We're not going to deal with them all today, as I said earlier. I've told you the scope, um, but um, let's go ahead with, with those we are, and top of the list, Part A, so it's Q Les, and I'll shut up and uh, listen and learn something. So I'll just stop sharing so that Les can. Over to you. Okay. When you were when you were going through the regulations that uh, that were applicable, I was thinking, what else did the Romans give us? When you got to the point on sanitation. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> right, um, current slide. Okay, let's see if I can get rid of that. Great, I've got a, a sidebar. There we go. 
Right. Okay. Well, that's we. Um, this is this is the this is the the whole objective. On the left hand side, we have a roof. In this case, it's relatively historical roof, cut and pitched, and we want to go from effectively what's on the left to what's on the right. And what I'm also going to do, I'm going to fire up my laser pointer. Hey. So we're going to go from what, what's on the, we want to go from what's on the left to what's on the right. And just like, probably more so than any other domestic um, um, alteration extension, it's probably got more constraints than, 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 than anything else. The first constraint is the ceiling to ridge. It's generally the first thing, you know, I would imagine that any, if anybody phones anybody up in the design field, that's probably the first thing that they're going to ask, well, you know, what have you got from ceiling to ridge? And if it's, you know, if it's around about two meters, then you're probably going to say no. If it's around 2.3, 2.4, you're going to, you know, you stand a chance. But I'm going to show you something in a minute, in, in a minute that will, will um, kind of blow that out of the water a little bit. So the first thing is um, they limit the position of the new beams. If you're going to put new beams in, especially if you're going to put a ridge beam in, it, it, it will affect that. There's no doubt about that. Um, lack of load bearing walls can be a, a, a constraint and obviously very common on truss draft roofs. And number four is staircases. And those of you who's designed loft conversions will know the whole the, the whole um, scheme will revolve around the position of the staircase. It's almost get your position of your staircase right, and then you 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 fit everything else around it. And existing members, there used to be a big problem with loft conversion years ago when the, the people would want uh, local authorities would want foundations exposing because of the the, the additional loads. Um, thank God that's out of the window. Nobody does that anymore because the load in, in the in, uh, um, additional loadings is is minimal. Um, so, but that sometimes you'll want to use an internal load bearing wall, and of course, you know, there's it's been very common to 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 make two rooms in uh, one uh, two rooms into one on the ground floor. So that can be a constraint as well. But here is the. This was, I was under contract at, um, at Hounslow and I was dealing with Chiswick and I opened this loft conversion up and that was the existing plan or roughly I've actually drawn this up but uh, that, it was about 1750 to, to seal, into, seal into ridge and I thought oh no chance and then I saw the section. So Basically what they did, there's the, there's the plate there. They effectively dropped the floor 500 millimeters. Of course, they're going to put a, a dormer roof uh, to, the, to the rear, so it needed a ridge beam anyway. So there's no problems with horizontal thrust as a result of dropping the floor. The floor was dropped down 500 millimeters um, and the, the floor joists were going to be 90 by 90 um, square hollow section steel um, to keep the thickness of the floor down. They dropped the, they dropped the, the story height on the, on the first floor to 2,200 and made some, um, made some details uh, around the window heads. So if, if, the, if the will is there, you can, you can generally convert anything. It just depends upon whether it was whether it's worth it. And this particular property in Chiswick, it, uh, it obviously was. And that's basically um, how they got over the, the, uh, the headroom constraint. Chimneys, um, probably they've got the, the, the biggest issue with chimneys is the support of the, of the ridge beam. And in this case, basically what you do, you'll stop the, the obviously you'll stop the, the ridge beam short of the short of the of the chimney stack. Um, and you'll place a, either a, a hundred by hundred box section, circular hollow section, or even hundred by hundred uh, timber um, is generally okay as well. And as a general, if you're really lucky, that will land exactly on top of the load bearing wall. Because the load bearing wall is consistent with 
is consistent with um, with chimneys. You know, with, if you've got a chimney, then you'll generally have an internal load bearing wall. So, but a lot of the times it doesn't because that central load bearing wall isn't central. It's, it's offset in one direction or another. And in this case, another beam was placed um, from from flank from the from the facade walls, front elevation, rear elevation. What well, it would be, yeah. Um, to the uh, to the internal load bearing wall to pick up the offset of that that member. So as we know, timber must be kept at a minimum of fifty millimeters off the face of the chimneys, and metal fixings no closer than fifty millimeters to the inside of the flue. Load bearing walls. Well, the classic the classic lack of load bearing walls is um, is uh, truss rafter roofs. And, uh, and and they're quite unique in the way that they actually converted. And this is much the same as a TDA truss. Those, those people who are a little bit older will remember or, or even seen the TDA trusses. Those are trusses at, at 1800 millimeter centers. Um, and they've got purlins in here, generally six per twos, six per twos, six per two binders, six per two binders, and, and common rafters and, and ceiling joists. Um, but the principle is exactly the same for, for trust rafters. And that's generally how you deal with it. The first thing I'm going to say is, is the you generally um, reinforce that top, that top um, span of the rafter with generally a six per two. And it, there's two reasons for that. The first reason is, is that the truss rafters and generally even on the historical buildings there, the, the rafters are on the limit and even just putting a bit of insulation and a bit of plasterboard on them will push them over the edge. So the first reason is to, to reinforce that rafter section generally with a six foot two and that will give you room to get your insulation in and a, a ventilation space if necessary. As far as the, as far as the, um, the, uh, concerned we pick up the we pick up the nodes or we can push out a little bit further than the nodes if necessary um, if you want to push it out a little bit further because remember we've got this six per two that's reinforcing the existing rafter and anything any if we push this wall in this direction it's only going to reduce the span of that fella um, so that's how we deal with the, that's how we deal with the uh, the supports to the to the rafters the, the like I say they 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 are supported by some people call them purling walls some people call them ashlarian walls and they of course are supported by beams located directly under the the the, the node points of the truss and then the the floor joists effectively span between the span between the the, the steel beams. What's insanely important at this point is is that those those floor those floor members also pick up the um, the uh, the ceiling the existing ceiling joists because when you chop all of these fellas out those ceiling joists are probably what 72 by 35s if they're not fixed to the new floor joists the existing ceiling is going to is going to go south but uh, uh, most contractors are obviously well aware of that Right, and the, the fourth constraint is the staircase. Um, now, the, the, I've shown the, a steel beam in there. There's a section through our typical modern um, loft conversion. And we've got effectively the bathroom may, may be in here and the third bedroom may be in here. And and the and the um, the stair the existing staircase will come up that way, and then the new staircase will will wrap round and will emanate itself somewhere around about here, and 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 come up in that in come up in that space there. Generally, the best place where you want to put the staircase because that's that's going to that's not going to 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 affect the space within the existing. Uh, within the existing um, first floor. You may have to move, it's poss possibly you may have to move this door a little bit closer because you may need a, you may need a riser in there. Um, but generally, um, especially if you've got a dormer window, which most loft conversions are, I can't remember the last time I saw loft conversion that didn't have a dormer window. So when you've got dormer windows, headroom issues, generally a little bit, a little bit easier. 
Um, remember that this staircase, remember a lot, most of the time, unless the, 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 um, the loft on the other side is converted, you may have to insulate along this wall here. If that's a gable wall, you may have to, well, you will have to upgrade that to 0 0.2, 0 0.28. Um, and you may have to pack that, that um, uh, staircase off the wall. So just be wary of just be wary of that one. It, can, it kind of it 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 picks it it surprises a lot of contractors. Um, it's shown on the drawings, but they don't realise the impact on the staircase. So um, so be wary of that one. Um, type two um, staircase. Um, this is where the the third bedrooms used to access. So the 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 third bedroom effectively goes the journey and the staircase and the staircase uh, um, starts um, very close to the existing to the existing window just be careful about just be careful about um, um, safety glazing in this area because obviously as you as you're picking up here anybody rolling down that, that stair you know that that area of glazing needs to be dealt with and of course, that staircase is going to is going to emanate around about here, which is absolutely fine. Um, but the the only other issue that if well, the only other issue you can have as a as a headroom issue there, if you have if you have no dormer window, then you'll have another beam that's coming along this particular area here, and in which case you'd have to trim around it. And, and that may put a bit of a load on that existing window, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Da, da, da. And the third one, probably the least popular, and to be fair, even on this example, it's, it, it wouldn't work because you would need a bigger, you would need a bigger roof. But this is where, this is where you, you utilize, you, you chop off part of the, the, either the front or the rear room, the largest room to, to, um, to accommodate the staircase. And that staircase will wrap round with a bit of luck, a load bearing wall. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit if it's not low, load bearing wall in a couple of seconds, but basically that comes up, wraps round. The entrance of the room is generally here. We, we generally have a bit of a landing, so, the, the, no need to be any any partitions in this particular area. The the problem is here is if if the this wall isn't load bearing, that what was not load bearing, then area area of, of floor is going to take some picking up because there's nothing to pick it up. In this particular case, what you would do, you would support it off a hanging yule post. So that new post would continue up and you and you would fix that there were double rafter. So you'd have a rafter, the new post, and then another rafter, and that would be bolted through. And that's how you effectively pick up that particular area. Um, but like I'm saying, it's not very common way of it's not a very common way of doing it. Um, and like I said, it can it can chop off quite a bit of a, a space off the room. Steel beams, certainly in the floors, of, is, is, is relatively new. Well, I'm saying relatively new. Since the 80s, before the 80s, you never saw floor beams. You never saw floor beams at all. It's, it's, it's uh, and, and, the, and the point of the floor beams was mainly for this fella here to remove the load from the existing facade windows because nine times out of 10, when you see how the loft conversions used to be designed, um, you will you you will see that it puts an additional load on the existing lintels, which is fine if it's a relatively new relatively new building, and it's got combined lintels steel combined steel lintels. But nine times out of ten, there may be the, the on the more historical buildings there may be sash windows with a piece of four by three over, so they always needed to be replaced. Uh, you get a little bit more um, economy on your staircase trimming when you've got the two beams and it reduces the span of the floor joists. And of course, it, if it reduces the span of the floor joists, it also reduces the depth. And as we all well aware now, um, headroom is a, is a main issue on, uh, on, on, on loft conversions. So... This is generally how we'll start off. Typical existing roof, uh, existing roof section. 
and we've got we've 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 got our we've got our steel beam in here, which is split off the the the, the ground floor reception rooms. But sometimes, remember this 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 wall here is taken half of that roof load. And sometimes, I know, so, somebody's not muted, guys. Can you check? I think we've got some homeschooling going on somewhere. If, if you can mute us all, Rach, and then um, and then bring back Les, that would be good. If, if we could, people could stay on mute, that would be excellent. Okay, Les, you're allowed to unmute and, and start talking again. <laughs> yeah, I was trying, but my laser pointer wouldn't do it. That laser right. pointer was. <laughs> laser. Um, yeah, but sometimes, remember this, this central load bearing wall has taken half of that roof load, and sometimes the load that we put back on the loft conversion is less than that amount of load. So sometimes it may be a matter of justifying this member down here, or it may be just simply a matter of that your engineer um, ascertaining that there's less load coming down in the proposed situation than there was in the existing. Um, da, 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 da. Right, next one. There. Yeah, we did that. Just, yeah. So this is how the this is how the conversions this is how the conversions were uh, were, were done years ago. So we always we with with any with any structure you always start from the top and work your way down. And as you can see, basically we the, the purlins have been replaced by the purlin walls, and that's been supported on the floor joists. And the floor joists are calculated for for stiffness, you know, and that's basically the the uh, the structural model that you would that you would do in this particular situation as you can see that's the load from the rafter that's the load from the ceiling that's a udl load of the floor and you would you would check that out and generally the joist would come in either 200s or 220s but the main disadvantage of this was was it always increases the load on the existing lintels and in the historical buildings they always needed to be replaced and, and as you're probably aware now, the, most, the more modern loft conversions now, the, the, people, the people in the existing house don't know that the, don't, other than noise, they don't know that the conversion's taken place until they knock the hole through for the, for the staircase. And the, the scaffolding and the access is all from the outside. Right, so like I said before, the, 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 the rafters, new rafters are placed alongside the existing. So that was the old school way of doing it. And this is a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, um, of, a, of a photograph of a commencement of a loft conversion. And you can see the, the, the new floor joists going in alongside the old ones and you would spike them through. Um, you would generally pack them off the plate by 10 millimetres, a bit of 10 millimetre timber. And that, that, especially if you've got lath and plaster, that just lifts these floor joists up slightly um, to avoid, um, to avoid uh, any damage to the existing ceiling. The most um, heavily um, loaded members here would be the members directly underneath the purlin. So they would, be pro they would definitely be multiple members because they'll be picking up the whole, you know, the roof load, where these, will only, these, these members here will only be picking up point loads. Um, from each individual rafter effectively. And that's how the that's how the uh, that's how the conversions were carried out with the with the dormers. Um, like I said, all the ridge beams always been there. Always the best place to put a ridge beam. There's your there's your flat roof, there's your flat roof joist, there's your your uh, your rafter, and the best place to put it is there. Now I've seen them being. I've seen ridge beams being placed in all sorts of positions, and and it's fine. You can put the ridge beam anywhere you want, but if it imposes, if it if if it means that additional mem the, the members justified in stiffness to take into account um, unconventional method um, unconventional um, positions of the ridge beam, then then so be it. Um, sometimes you can get away with anything about. 1800s about as far as I've seen for, for, dormer, for dormer roofs without 
a ridge beam, I picked up on treble rafters. So you might go treble six for twos on either side and a, and a, member, bet and a member between the, the two. That's a, probably as about as big as I've seen is, is 1800. After 1800, you generally talk about getting into a, a, into a ridge beam. But again, this situation, same situation here, these fellas are going to, these fellas are going to overload uh, the lintels. The lintels are going to have more load on them than what they previously did. Da, da, da. So this is the modern way it's all done, which we've 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 already we've already seen. I've already talked you through a particular method, um, and like I said, the only thing that's going to affect the position of these beams is staircase trimming. If the staircase is coming up in this particular area, along this area, then this fella here needs to be moved to to here, and and it may mean that the floor joists need to be designed in stiffness. Um, but same, what I was saying to you before, you pick up the you pick up this, the uh, truss rafters at the at the nodes, and you make sure that you fix the existing ceiling joist to the to the uh, floor joist. Otherwise, it will go south very very quickly. This is this is the this is the the new school way of of, of converting lofts. Now, Let's start at the top. <clears throat> Put the, the put the ridge beam in this particular position here, and we're going to do. We're going to have a look at a, at a, at a, at a few details of ridge beams, but it's not the best place to put it. But like I'm saying, sometimes you can't always have perfection, long as it's adequate and it's suitably supported. Then that's all we're looking for. So that that ridge beam has gone from being here to go to to there because we're always fighting for headroom. Um, the the back end of the the front of the roof because the dormers are inevitably on the back because of planning restrictions um that's that's done exactly the same as a truss rafter so it'll go effectively underneath the purlin if you're lucky you can you can utilize this wall and under those circumstances you can generally get away with 650 deep joists um and just remember, you can always, you can put, you know, providing it, uh, one of them goes alongside the existing ceiling joist, you can put them in the 300 centres. So you could put six by twos, you know, 147 by 47 at 300 centres, or alternatively, um, you can put 147 by 75s in it at, at, um, at, at four or 600 centres, you know, subject to calculations. One of the things that we need to take away is this fella here. To avoid overloading this lintel, we, we, always seem to, we always seem to get this one, but this one we don't seem to get. And sometimes these lintels have had to be replaced because the load's increased uh, as a result of, obviously it's taken half of this dormer roof plus, the, plus this wall. And, and if, that's, if that's tile hung, it can be quite a substantial load. So what I always say is putting a 200 by 100 um, sole beam in there, located over the existing ceiling joists and uh, and then packed up off the plate in between the windows and that will that will maintain the fact that will maintain no additional load goes on top of these particular lintels um, and like I say that's probably that's probably the best piece of advice you know that, that sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't if I catch if I used to catch them early on the commencement I would always um, I would always uh, always tell them that um, like I said, that wall, even with a, with a even with a um, with with a beam in there, there's a good chance that that's going to take less load than it would if it was carrying half of a tiled roof. I would hazard a guess in that particular situation, that wall there will be taking less load under this situation than it would under the existing condition. Okay, so we'll have a look at some have a look at some details. The devil's always in the details. Splices, obviously manual handling requirements and things like that. These, these, like I say, came in in the 80s and, and they, were, they were fiercely, that, that type of connection was fiercely resisted by the London boroughs uh, in the 80s until somebody pointed out, well, so there's no different a ridge connection in a, it's no different a ridge connection in B and Q or a, or a, super, or a shed. Um, in which case, then you know the the, the resistance tend, tended to fall away. While I'm, I'm showing you this, if you if you notice that these floor joists here are only surface fixed on that plate, 
Now, some of the long-legged joist hangers des are designed to wrap around, so there'd be a plate on top of this beam, and that would that would wrap around and 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 fix onto there. And so, if they're only surface fixed, there will be a load reduction on the on the on the joist, which is generally no problems on the floor joist because they're only taken they're only taken a, a standard load. But if you've got trimmers um, where you might have two or three members together, then um, the the joist hanger may become may become critical if it's surface fixed if it's wrapped round a, a plate on the top then things are always a lot better the thing is with that type of connection it works better for deeper beams than shallower beams and the other thing i would always say is is that you should always use a 20 millimeter plate in there so it's 20 millimeter plate to 20 millimeter plate you can design them down to 10, 12 millimetres. The problem is when you start putting 400 amps into that plate, unless it's substantial, it'll warp all over the place. And I've seen engineers design these plates, you know, using software, getting them down to the absolute minimum. And then when, when somebody pumps 400 amps into them to weld them, um, they distort the plates. So you don't get a clean connection there. So, when I say, you know, use 20 millimeter plates, it's not because it's structurally necessary, it's because that the, the, the welding won't distort the plates. Um, so we've dealt with all of that. Uh, situations like that, I think we've, we've already said about the, the much the same as what I've said. And there you can see the bolts, there's, there's three bolts in, in, in this fella. And you can see it temporarily picking up the, the ceiling joists as well. So, you know, that it, that's a, a, a more of a contractor thing, um, but it's common, it's common sense. If you, if you don't pick these fellas up, they will go south. That's, that, these are splice details. That's a typical traditional beam uh, splice. So old school engineers, when they're talking about beam splices, that's what they're talking about. You put a beam into, bending you and the and the bottom flange turns into tension and the top flange turns into compression so all of these bottom bolts are all in shear and the top bolts are all in shear and the plates in the middle pick up this, the, the actual shear from the from the beam that's how but the problem is with that is you can't you you don't want this space to the underside of the beam being used so this is this is what everybody wants to use and so that's a typical so in this particular situation, the beam, the, the, the bolts are in, in tension. They want to pull apart. Once to open up like a zip. So the the um, the top flange there, that's in compression. The bottom flange there, that's in tension, and it rotates about that point there if the plates are stiff enough. That's a bonus of making having twenty millimeter plates. If you have twenty millimeter plates, you can take your point of rotation there, and uh, and help the engineer because the strength of this plate here, that, that, that connection there, depends upon the distance between these bolts. If the distance between these bolts is huge, then the, the, the stiffness of the connection is huge. If it's small, then the stiffness of the connection will also be, be, be small too. That's why it doesn't tend to work very well with 152 by 152s, because you can only get generally about 120 millimeters between the bolts. Um, so, but, Fortunately, those members are a little bit, you know, less less loaded. Here we have a couple of couple of couple of ridge beams. I can't even figure out why there's a ridge beam in this one. To be fair, um, because both rafters are in there. That's ahead of the arch. The only reason you could possibly put that need that beam in there is if you've lost the tie-in action of the of the ceiling joists. So if the tie-in action of the ceiling joists is gone, then you need that ridge beam in there. Now this ridge beam here depends on the distance of that member there and the connection in at this point here. So that needs to be a decent connection, you know, a couple of generally, generally a couple of two timber locks will do it, or you know, a 10 millimeter bolt uh, will deal with that. This is a typical ridge beam with a plate on top. So the plates fired to the fired to the um, to the uh, to the ridge beam. And the rafters are bird's mouth over the over the plate, which, which is you know this is good old old school. Got to love a seed cut and a, a plum cut. Ridge beams is probably the first place I'll look 
on a, on a loft conversion, the first thing I look at is the ridge is the, is the ridge beam because it, it it as much as you I want to split off um, structure and condensation control, they are joined at the hip. Um, if you've got a cold deck roof, if you've got a cold deck roof, you you generally going to need a ventilated ridge. And if you push this fella right up to the top, you can't get a ventilated ridge on there. So you can't ventilate uh, a roof, a flat roof to pitch roof connection where it just goes in like that. I'll show you uh, an option for that in a minute. But that would work quite well. We've got um, 25 millimeter gap at the soffit here. We've got a ventilated ridge system here with five 5,000 square millimeters of, of ventilation every meter. So, you know, that works quite well. In this particular case, the ridge beam has been pushed up and it's hanging the, the flat roof joists. Then the flat roof joists will then be bolted, good fixing connection under here and, and, and everything's cool. Um, on this particular, that, that's the best, like I said before, always the best place to put the ridge beam, but it's not always possible. Um, because there we get a connection there to the for, from the from the rafter to the to the floor joy uh, to the ceiling uh, flat roof joist and it's and the supports there where it should be and again we've got the cold deck um, cross ventilation that's necessary as as a result of part C. D -d 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 yeah, now this is where it gets a little bit it gets a little bit moody and I'm hoping you can see see this. Um, warm deck roofs, there's a fallacy that, oh, I can't get a warm deck roof because it's too deep. But this is, we are allowed to go as to the height of the existing ridge. That's what the, that's what the, the you know, the LDC, the Lawful Development Certificate will allow you to do. Uh, and what I would, and, and another thing to take away from this, you know, those people who are designing, get an LDC, get a Lawful De Development Certificate for your, for your loft, loft conversion. And, uh, and and put this detail in so they know exactly what they're approving. Um, so here we've got we've got the ridge beam effectively just under the existing ridge, and we've managed to get a fur in and the um, and the insulation over the top and, and the over over the top of that, and it still comes in under existing ridge height. Now what I've done on the second on this one here, I've I've with 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 AutoCAD I've taken that, coloured it red and superimposed it onto there. And as you can see, none of the the new flat roof actually goes above the ridge. So it, it technically complies with the LDC requirements of not altering the, the profile of the roof on the front. Obviously, the profile of the roof on the back is altered, but that's within your cubic meter capacity of the of the of the GDO. So what's important here is if we stick this, going back to the structure, but if we stick that ridge beam in there, we need a connection between the, 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 the flat roof joist and the rafters. Um, and that's one of the problems when you stick your ridge beam in there. And in this case, we've got a 30 by five mil strap and we bend it um, with an, uh, and generally it's best to be hot form bend, get the fabricator to do it, take a, take a template there, uh, for the fabricator to bend it up and you fix that to the rafters and you fix that to the to the flat roof joists. It's key under these circumstances that these flat roof joists go in at the same centres as the existing rather than what, because if you put these in at 400 centres and the existing rafters are at 365 millimetre centres or whatever, certainly which is the case in a lot of historical buildings, this strap won't line up. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be fixed into fresh air. So it's key when we, one of the key things is, is when we push that ridge beam up, we get a connection. Da, 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 da. I think that might sums that up. Here's an ease detail. Um, and again, we just assuming that we, we, we get ventilation in there. You're always better opening up the getting, I know I'm um, drifting onto ventilation, but you're always better off getting the ventilation there if you need 25,000 square millimetres per metre, because you'll never get it with tile, with tile vents. Tile vents do about 7,000 uh, square millimetres. So you would need four tile vents per metre 
And if you look at some of the, some of the old conver some conversions, you'll look up and you'll see just a row of tile vents along the roof. And that's because that's how many is needed to get up to this 25,000. Always better off using, using this, the strip. Um, there's the a, a typical detail of the of the um, of the flat of the floor joist being supported by the uh, by the steel beam. If you notice that wraps over the top, so we get full load capacity on that on that fella there, and that's sat into a that's sat there into a into a, a seat cut there, plumbing a seat cut or a bird's mouth or whatever you want to call them or beaks. I've heard them called beaks before. You want to beak it out, mate? Yeah, Russell Russell will understand. So that's the that's basically the uh, the detail. That more or less um, ties up the structure. Hope, I hope it didn't put too many people to sleep. And I shall stop sharing. Thanks for that, Les. I got well engrossed in that. I forgot I've got to say a bit now again. Um, <laughs> it's great to see another old boy who mixes his metaphors in terms of old money and new money. You know, six for twos and one fifties and whatever uh, yeah we're of an age isn't we we crossed over and we can't get out of the habit meter deep foundations by by uh by one foot six wide yeah anyway enough of that um banter let's let's get on i'll share my screen again and hopefully i can get back into things with my next slide and you should be seeing now a slide on fire safety hopefully uh somebody can shout yes trevor we've got off screen uh, a slide that would be good um so yeah it's that yeah excellent so back to me these are the sections of part b on the slide that we're going to deal with because they've got particular ref reference relevance to loft conversions that's B1 means of a warning and escape, B3, internal fire spread structure, and B4, which is external fire spread. Okay, on to requirement B1, covering means of warning and escape, and it says that the building should be designed and constructed so that there are appropriate provisions for the early warning of fire and appropriate means of escape in case of fire from the building to a place of safety outside the building, capable of being safely and effectively used at all material times. So first let's cover the easy bit, which is means of warning. Not a lot to worry about there in most cases. Means of warning in a loft conversion is usually straightforward. For, um, exactly the same rules applies for an extension or something like that, or a new house. Um, with a simple house layout, that means a grade D, and by that I mean mains powered linked smoke detectors with battery backup to BS14604 uh, and there are they are provided to category LD3 which is defined in the, the British Standard 5839 part 6 and what that means is we put smoke detectors in the circulation spaces at ground first and second floor levels if they're not there already um, so that's the ground floor hall that's the second floor and first floor landings usually only one at uh, each level but on a bigger house you might have to put an extra one in so that you are within seven and a half meters of a bedroom door which is one of the rules you have to look out for so that was warning onto means of escape and as you can see in the diagram taken from uh, approved document b the requirements for means of escape from a house with one floor more than four and a half meters above ground level is more onerous than for uh, no floors above four and a half meters. So, uh, and of course it becomes more onerous still if there's a floor over seven and a half meters. We're not gonna cover that today because we've got enough to, to be getting on with. So in forming a three story house, we now need to provide, as you probably know, a protected escape route that will give uh, a route of escape from the new second floor rooms to a final exit. Uh, and the extra new story formed by the loft conversion obviously creates a greater risk as it's not possible to safely exit from a window as it is at first floor level. You're, you're not going to sprain an ankle, you're going to break your leg, break your neck. So uh, that's why 
we, we need a, a safe route to be um, provided in the event of a fire. So in effect, this means providing fire resisting internal walls enclosing the stair with any doors to a room that could pose a fire risk being separated by a fire door. Any glazing in that enclosure also needs to be fire resisting. And the theory, of course, is that smoke detectors will alert the occupants of a fire uh, and then the fire door and the fire resistant construction will contain smoke and flames within the room of origin uh, of the fire to give time to the occupants to get out before the route becomes impassable. This all makes total sense, doesn't it? And some might observe that with fire doors no longer required to have self closing devices, which was a uh, quite a contentious uh, decision. Um, you know, what, what's the chances in the average family house of all the doors being closed uh, at night? Uh, I don't know about your experiences, but I, uh, in my experience, not great. You know, children don't like their doors being shut. So um, as I always say, an, an open fire door is as, as much use as one made out of rice paper. It's not gonna do it. Yes, it can be closed, but, but by that time you, you may have smoke onto the escape route. And these are the optional arrangements. Let me, I'm gonna grab a laser. Laser is very free and easy with his laser pointer, so why shouldn't I be? Yes, right. These are the optional arrangements for ground floor level. So in the normal way of things, you will protect the route from the second floor rooms all the way to a final exit at ground floor level. So in the less than diagram, um, you've got one option, which is to have uh, an escape route that discharges directly to a, a final exit. So we're down the stairs and we're straight over a final exit and, and there's our protected enclosure. That works very nicely. The other option is if you can't go directly to a final exit from the, the ground floor hallway, then you make sure you've got two routes of escape, exit one there, exit two there, and you make sure those two routes are separated by fire resisting construction. So there we have it, a fire door there. So that if a fire starts there, it doesn't prejudice escape from using this route to final exit two. Hopefully that's clear. And just a reminder, designers and builders, I find often forget that the fire integrity of the protected stair enclosure does need to be maintained at roof level. And depending on the circumstances um, and the design, there's several options available for that. It might just be as simple as fire stopping the rafter void um, between ceiling level and up to the underside of the roof tiles where the, the partition, the fire resisting partition abuts. Alternatively, it might be something like, like is shown in the two diagrams where you may cap it off with a, a fire resisting ceiling in that way. And obviously that needs to be fire resisting from, from two directions. Or you might put vertical, um, effectively carry the partitions up and form cavity barriers to the underside it's not cavity barriers, they should be actual fire stops or, 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 or um, fire resisting construction up to the underside of the roof. Again, fire stopping the gap between the, uh, the top of the wall and the underside of the tiles. So one to remember there. Wet rooms and cupboards, questions are often asked of us about, um, you know, what do we do about these rooms uh, that, lead, that often lead on to the protected stair enclosure? Um, you know, what do we do in relation to fire separation? Well, bath and shower rooms, as we know, present a low risk of fire breaking out and normally building control consequently allow them not to have fire doors. So they then need to be considered as being contained within the protected stair enclosure, as we have here. So that's our bathroom. We're not going to look for any fire separation there. But what we're going to do is we can say it's going to be contained within this protected enclosure to the stair. So that's fine. As long as we have in mind that we, you know, these walls as well need to be FR to maintain the integrity. Um, one thing to say there, if the room contains an airing cupboard, I, um, that's no longer low risk. An airing cupboard is, is a, some of my fire officer colleagues tell me, is a regular source of fire outbreak around the country. Uh, you do get um, old immersion heaters sparking out and of course you've got a ready source of fuel in there and cupboard so if you've got an airing cupboard in there we would look for either well we would look for a fire 
fire separation at that point and a fire door there in the normal way. There, there is a fire risk. Um, same for, for cupboards, our thoughts on cupboards, uh, and I'm not saying that that's consistent around the country, but we think that they should be fitted with fire doors if they contain a fire load and an ignition source, um, i.e. they've got some electrical equipment in them. Um, some I know, some authorities and some of the people uh, in the audience today, that their authorities may, may insist on fire doors for all cupboards. Uh, my thought is, well, I mean, theory there is that there's, you may get spontaneous combustion occurring. Uh, I think that's highly unlikely. Personally, I don't think the risk is negligible and that's why we don't get too excited unless there is some sort of electrical equipment in that space. Certainly, if it's an understairs cupboard and you've traditional arrangement of a, a electricity meter and maybe a gas meter, then uh, as we all know, there's, you're looking to underline the stairs with maybe a couple of layers of, of plasterboard and also put a fire door on that stair, uh, on that cupboard, should I say, um, as it uh, enters the um, protected stair enclosure. FD20 doors. Now, we discuss, when we discuss fire doors in loft conversions, it's often an issue that comes up that confuses people, the terms FD30 and FD20. Um, one of the points I make to our, our new surveyors and graduates when we, when we train them is that a fire door is only a fire door if it has been tested in a kiln to BS476 or an, a, an equivalent uh, harmonised European standard. And that's by an accredited laboratory and then it's only a fire door if it's fitted in the same way as it was tested using the same hardware, um, same frames, etc, etc. Um, now FD30 signifies the door with full half hour fire resistance under test in terms of integrity because that's what we measure when, we, when we're looking at fire doors. Whereas FD20 only looks for 20 minutes integrity. One being manufacturers don't make 20 minute fire doors, there's no market for them, that you, you won't find one available. So all those tested are FD30 and they're all by and large tested with the provision of intumescent strips around them, i.e. the little plastic strips that will foam and char and then seal the perimeter of the door against fire uh, getting through those gaps and that's usually on the, as we know, on the top and the sides of the door. Um, without giving chapter and verse, a few years back, the Building Control Alliance, and that's an organisation um, that is represented by both private sector building control, the dark side as we to, like to call them uh, affectionately, and, and local authority building control. I now sit on that group, but I didn't at the time. And it issued a guidance note that um, they bounced off the, the government at the time, and they seemed quite happy with it, and it recommended that doors tested to FD30 standard with a good fit, um, uh, by that I mean a four millimeter maximum edge gap and a 10 millimeter bottom gap, should be accepting as meeting that FD20 standard without the need for intumescent strips. So for, for many years now on that basis, um, we've not been insisting on them being provided and fitted if it's an FD30 door. We've always recommended they should be, we, we, you know, we deal in minimum standards, but we encourage um, higher standards. Um, I didn't agree with the advice at the time, and I think I was a voice shouting in the wilderness because uh, I certainly got ignored. So obviously in interest of consistency, um, we, we went along with the national guidance. Um, ironically, as I sat at the BCA meeting last, last time, which is a few weeks ago, um, the, the point was raised, why on earth are we allowing FD20 standard um, without seals if, if nobody's actually tested them? Uh, and I sort of chuckled and said, well, yeah, it's funny you should say that. So that's going to be tabled at the next meeting. I think post Grenfell, now we're all a lot twitchier about um, fire door standards, um, we might find um, that changing and we will be looking for intermittent seals on, on every fire door, whether it be FD20 or FD30, but watch this space, we'll let you all know if, if and when that happens. Whilst we're on the subject, there is an earth, urban myth that many building control surveyors cling to, and a lot of uh, you in the audience, I'm sure, remember, as I do from days as a trainee, that a fire door needs 25 millimetre thick door stops, and they should be glued and screwed to the frame at 150 millimetre centres, 
Um, as I say, that was the case years ago, um, but technology has moved on and that's no longer the case. So a standard 10 mil doorstop is perfectly adequate. We look for three hinges, ideally steel or, or a decent quality brass. That's the resistive door warping as it gets heated uh, by the fire. Um, another point to make, it's always good practice to pop off the architraves on a, on a fire door uh, where you're doing loft conversions um, to check that the, you know, if there's any linear gaps um, between the frame and the masonry, then they should be plugged up with a fire resistant caulking or some sort of intermessant, and then the, the um, architraves can be replaced. I don't know how often that gets done, um, but that is the textbook way it should be done. Finally, on means of escape, I want to tell you about alternatives when a customer doesn't want to change his door for fire doors, as I'm sure some of the designers out there come across. They either love their fancy doors or they've got sort of uh, architectural or, or historic importance. Uh, you know, maybe it's a listed building and the conservation officer says over my dead body. Well, one option is to use a proprietary intermessent paint system to upgrade them. I'm not going to mention any trade names. There are different products are available. Um, and they're usually suitable for good quality panel doors. Not, not in my experience for hollow cord modern type doors, the egg boxes as we call them. Um, I don't think there's anything that can upgrade those. Um, what I would say is be very careful if you are going to select these products, make sure they've been independently tested by a UCAS or equivalent accredited body and uh, that the manufacturers say that they are suitable for the particular door being upgraded. And sometimes panel thickness is critical and sometimes you have to incorporate interesting paper and all sorts to, to do the job. But it's an option there. Um, another option proposed a few years ago um, was something that the Hertfordshire Technical Forum came, came up with. Um, and it was so, after self-closing devices were no longer mandatory. Um, and we were sort of looking for a rational off the peg fire safety strategy um, that would be appropriate for certain very simple basic loft conversions. Because the, a guide had come in called the Construction Products Associ Association Loft Conversion Guide and that had mooted the idea that, that you could trade off with fire detection, but it was a very unclear document and it really was a sledgehammer to crack a nut and didn't really make a lot of sense. And people were misusing that advice uh, and just putting a few smoke detectors in and saying, well, they are, we don't need fire doors. Anyway, Hertfordshire Technical Forum um, came up with this, this standard. They formed a steering group, which include, included the fire engineer and a fire detection expert. And... Um, what we did was propose a minimum standards for a resilient system that would compensate for having non-fire rated doors off the stair enclosure. And what we agreed was that the conversions that would be applicable as, you know, as being within the scope of this trade-off were existing houses with floors less than four and a half metres above ground level. In other words, two-storey houses where you're going to add another storey. Um, and only one additional story that would be no more than that would be more than four and a half, but no more than seven and a half meters above ground level. A maximum of two had habitable rooms, and a maximum new second floor area of fifty square meters. So, as I'm saying, that was the scope for simple, typical loft conversions, and probably ninety percent of loft conversions would come into those criteria. And the option. Um, allows for existing non fire rated doors, as I say, to be left in place and compensated for by an enhanced category LD1. So we've gone from LD3 to LD1 fire detection system to be fitted in the house to compensate. And that's throughout the whole house. And the idea is that there's a mains powered linked detector in every risk room or cupboard that is off the stair in other words, that might present a fire risk. And the system, as you see on the right there, the system includes this central control box, and that should be sited next to the final exit door. And that can be used to either silence the alarms or test the alarms, or to isolate the alarm that's going off um, so that you can tell where the fire is if you're not sure. 
So as I say, it's only appropriate for conversions within the scope mentioned. It's not an appropriate uh, off the peg anyway compensation for uh, a loft conversion where there's an open plan arrangement. So you've got an open plan ground floor. Um, that you'd need a lot more thoughts or something like that. Might not be available in other counties. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I think, it, you know, certainly it was accepted in Hertfordshire and I know that there's lots of other neighbouring councils who accept a similar trade-off. Um, for myself, I don't know what you think, but I prefer my family to be protected by a state-of-the-art system like that. That is the absolute earliest possible warning of a fire rather than rely on a, a rickety old fire door with no self-closure that may or may not be closed. Um, so just to mention, detectors can be wirelessly linked, which saves a lot of hassle for the installer, but they need, do need to be hardwired to mains power, i.e. the lighting circuit. That's because that's what the British Standard 5839 requires. Um, it doesn't really make sense. Technology has moved on with sealed batteries. The, the battery life exceeds the life of the detector itself. So I think in time we, we may um, relent and, and allow battery only systems. I don't think it makes any sense not to, but we have to accord with the British standards as it is at the moment. It's not a cheap option. Um, talking to people who've put it in, it, you know, when with the installation and the, the cost of the hardware, um, it doesn't work out much cheaper, if any, than changing the doors over. But it's, you know, it's there for designers to use in this county if you want to. And uh, so I mentioned open plan ground floors. Um, very popular these days. Um, look, at, consider the open plan ground floor in the in the photo there. We've got a nice, beautiful stair that. Uh, and that's leading up to a converted loft on the second floor. And of course, we've got a, a, a final exit route that does not meet the requirements um, that we looked at a few, few slides back. You know, is there a, a stair to a final exit or two separate routes? No, there's not. Um, well, fortunately, approved document B permits houses with loft conversions to two storey dwelling houses to have open plan ground floor if a sprinkler system to British Standard 9251 is fitted to cover that area, so to cover the open plan area. Um, it also stipulates that there must be a fire resistant partition and fire door to prevent smoke from contaminating the escape route from the second floor rooms down to a first floor escape window. So the emergency escape route must be protected from smoke in the early stages. So before the sprinklers cut in, you may get a lot of smoke produced. You don't want that getting up the stairs and, and um, preventing an easy escape by those first floor windows if that's the only way to get out. That separation is usually at first floor level because of course that's a, that's a nicer arrangement if there's room, but it can be at ground floor level. But of course that would, that would mess up the uh, the ambiance you might call it of that ground that beautiful ground floor area there so perhaps you wouldn't uh, you would try and get that at first floor level um when we're looking at sprinklers we look for the system to be tested to the relevant british standard and designed fitted and commissioned by appropriately qualified companies to look for some sort of recognition of baths or something like that to show that they they know their onions um, and it's also really important for a designer and certainly for building control to make sure the householder is aware of the importance of the system, what it's there to do, and the needs need to maintain it. And then after 10 years to replace the fittings, <coughs> because, um, you know, it, it, it really is highly, highly critical to the safety of, of, that, uh, of that house. Um, in, putting, in considering sprinklers, water pressure is critical, as most of you know, so it's always a good idea to, to check the pressure at the main to make sure it's viable, um, because you don't want to then find out it needs a pump and a thousand litre storage tank, and you suddenly you've got to find space uh, to support a tonne of water in the building. Of course, there is another option <coughs> to use water mist systems, which may get over that problem. Um, and then we'd look for accordance with the standard BS8458. Uh, and that's a, that's a 
a new way of dealing with that risk. That was B1, that was the bulk of it. Briefly to talk about the, the other uh, part B sections, B3, uh, and there we say that the building should be designed and constructed so that in the event of a fire, its stability will be maintained for a reasonable period. So in other words, we're saying that we want the new structure elements of the house and those affected to be sufficiently fire resistant. Um, we don't want them to collapse prematurely on the occupants um, or on the fire and rescue service who might have gone in to uh, fight the fire or try and rescue people. So what elements need fire resistance? Well, it's the floors, for sure, isn't it? It's it walls that support floors and any steel beams that support walls that support floors. Um, roof members, do we need fire resistance for those? No, we don't. Um, that's not critical. Uh, the ridge beam that Les showed us earlier, they don't need fire protection either. They're not supporting a floor. Um, of course, a roof does need a, a, a fire rating, but that's about fire spread between buildings. Um, that's a B4 requirement we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that's based on expo uh, external exposure, not exposure within the, the building itself. What standard do we look for? We look for a 30 minute standard in a three story house. Where does it say that? Uh, it says it here in ADB, volume one, table A1. And they, are, they have highlighted it for you. Uh, look carefully, there are two different standards for fire resistance for two story. There we have it, 30, 15, 15. That's known as the modified half hour. Um, <clears throat> 30 stability or load bearing capacity, 15 integrity, 15 insulation or REI as we say in Euro lingo um, as exposed from the underside. But here we, we have it, If it, that's two stories. If we go to three stories, we see a reference to C table A2 and uh, table A2 will tell us actually we need 30, 30, 30. So we need a full half hour. So in converting our loft and forming a new second floor, suddenly there's a material effect on the existing floors as well as needing fire resistance in the, in the new second floor. Right, so, um, so we have to consider that material alteration in adding the additional story and then think, well, okay, so we'd have to upgrade these existing floors to the higher standard if it doesn't meet the 30, 30, 30 standard. And let's face it, in an old house, usually it will not. You know, a Victorian house is, is you know, it's not been adapted too much, it's not going to achieve that. So as I say, no problem for a modern first floor existing, usually we've got at least 90 millimetres tongue and groove chipboard or sometimes softwood boarded deck. We've got 50 mil wide joists, two inches in less speak and, uh, sorry less, and a 12 and a half millimetre plasterboard ceiling. Uh, and it will achieve the full 30, 30, 30 standard. But an old floor with a lath and plaster ceiling and maybe it's got 50 mil, maybe it's got square edge, software floorboards, maybe there's gaps and traps and holes all over the place. It's, you know, it's had a hundred years of abuse uh, and it definitely won't achieve that standard. Also, sometimes we'll find that the first floor ceiling is only nine and a half mil plasterboard. So again, that won't achieve that, that half hour full standard. So, you know, let, let's take that example of uh, uh, a nine and a half mil ceiling to an existing first floor and might achieve that modified half hour but is that is that acceptable when we're, we're forming this three-story building do we need to upgrade it um and also maybe we need to upgrade the first floor ceiling because that's going to be part of the new second floor we might need to improve the fire resistance there what's the answer <clears throat> well fortunately with ad Document B, clause 5.4, gives some guidance and allows us to relax, allows us to relax the requirements in some cases. As, as you see there, it says we're adding an additional story to a two-story single family dwelling house. New forms should have a minimum REI, stability, integrity, insulation, 30 minutes. 
any floor forming part of the enclosure to the circulation space between the loft conversion and the final exit should achieve the minimum REI 30. But here's the trade-off. The existing first story construction should have a minimum rating of R30. So just um, the integrity there. Um, sorry that's just the stability rating should i say um, the fire performance may be reduced for integrity and insulation when both of the following conditions are met in other words you can have the 15 minute uh, for the stability uh, for the integrity and insulation if if a only one story is added and containing a maximum of two habitable rooms well that rings a bell doesn't it from a previous slide and b the new story has a maximum total area of 50 meters squared. So in other words, new second floors always need, as we see here in the diagram, new second floors always need to be full 30 minutes, but existing floors that don't separate the protected stair enclosure can have that modified standard, 30, 15, 15. That said, an old traditional lard and plaster ceiling probably wouldn't be relied upon to achieve even a modified half hour. You cannot place any, confidently place any fire resistance on lard and plaster. Too many unknowns, age, condition, what's, what's it made of, you know, how much horse hair is in, has been thrown into that. Um, so uh, it, it can, lard and plaster can easily be upgraded. That might be by adding a layer of plasterboard underneath. Usually that's over a, a bit of wire mesh that's stapled to the underside of the lard and plaster. Or it just can be stripped off and, and replaced with with plasterboard um or alternatively there are options for upgrading these floors within the floor void because it might be an ornate ceiling um, or something of architectural importance that needs to be retained or plain edge boarded floors mentioned that you know they can be in poor condition well they can be tidied up and upgraded with a thin layer of hardboard and just a, a little reminder, don't forget the eaves area. If you remember some of Leslie's um, uh, drawings that he presented where the joists go into the eaves area, um, if that area of floor is not decked, then you are reducing the fire resistance in that zone, in the eaves zone. So if you're not going to carry the deck to the edge, then a good idea is put some chicken wire um, between those joists, stapled in, and support mineral fiber well, uh, insulation on that to uh, compensate for the lack of a deck. And then when the when the ceiling falls away after you know 15 minutes in a, into a fire, you've got that rock wall supported on the on the mesh to maintain the fire resistance. Quick slide. They are we're, we're nearly uh, there now on part B, but they're just B four. Um, B4 is about fire spread between buildings. There's not a lot that's specifically relevant to loft conversions. Uh, if you're forming in dormers, then of course the roof invariably needs to meet the fire rating because it's close to the boundary. And that needs to be B roof T4 in Euro speak. That's what we used to call in old money, AA, AB or AC, the BS476 passes. <clears throat> Apart from the roofs, the dormer cheek walls, um, are non-load bearing, so they only need fire resistance to deal with any fire spread risk across the boundary. So we need to consider the limits of unprotected area, uh, and then different rules apply to that depending on whether the cheek is more than one meter from the boundary or not. If it's under a meter from the boundary, then you are permitted a maximum of one square meter of unprotected area. In other words, form a cheek without necessary fire resistance any more than one square meter and the cheap needs fire resistance and that's where it's within a meter that's from inside and outside exposure and that's why sometimes um, we might pick up our designer and say you need to maybe put a, a, a lining behind the tile battens maybe a, a cement particle board superlux other cement particle boards are available uh, to um, to improve fire resistance from outside exposure. If you're over a metre distant to the boundary, obviously not in this case, that one that uh, would need exposure from both sides. If you're over a metre, then normal limits apply depending on the distance. 
uh, and that would relate to fire resistance from inside only. So these would be easily achieved by uh, you know typical construction with a barboard lining and a OSB sheathing externally. Right, um, I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm not going to go over to stairs because it's time for somebody else to speak. Uh, and bear with me. Over to Les. And uh, Les is going to cover that. Be muted, Les. I've got a pound for every time I said you're muted to someone. No, we're not we're not getting you, Les. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Excellent. Right. I've lost my present I've lost my presentation. Is here somewhere? <laughs> um I've got my presentation. <laughs> my my um New share, try new share. Just shows it's live and real. It's a bit kitchen sink. I think the audience like this sort of thing. There we go. You've got me. There we go. <coughs> but, well, that wasn't where I wanted to start. I've done that. <laughs> that. That wasn't where I wanted to start. No, we'll, we'll go through that again. It was very good, but once is enough. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, like I said, be, like I said before. Te oh, cheers, Trev. Thanks. Thanks for that. I got all I, I, I got all uh, engrossed in. Oh, good God! Where's my presentation gone? Um, like I said before, the 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 ventilation and the structures kind of joined at the hip, so there'll be a little, we we're going to repeat ourselves a little bit. Um, but basically, this is this. If we look at if we look at warm and cold deck roofs. I think it, that might not be a bad place to start. I think I've got 10 minutes, so um, hopefully we'll be able to get through this within that. So as far as the pitch roof elements concerned, that's always going to be a cold deck. Um, for that to be a warm deck, you'd have to strip the tiles off the outside and, 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 and provide insulation. Of course, that's not going to happen if it's attached to anything. So inevitably, it's always going to be cold deck. Um, the pitch roof is going to be cold deck, and that's going to either need uh, ventilation top and bottom or alternatively we can use a breather membrane um, but if you look at that if you oh I'll tell you what we could I could do with I'm gonna I'm gonna get my laser out again let's see if I can get my laser out there we go I feel at home now now that I've got my laser yeah so obviously this is the, the pitch roof is going to be called is going to be called deck that we're going to have 50 millimeters, you know, between the top top edge of the insulation and the and the underside of the and the underside of the of the felt, whether that's existing felt or whether it's stripped off and, and replaced. Um, as far as the flat roofs is concerned, again, pretty much simple and straightforward. Um, cold deck, cold deck flat roof, insulation between the joists, insulation underneath the joists, and the warm deck flat roof insulation over the top of the over the over the top of the joists and you know with their respective positions of the VCRs. Da -da. Right what I'm going to do first I'll do the warm deck first and and I'll and we'll, as far as the warm decks concerned we know that we don't have to we don't have to ventilate the warm deck so everybody's happy with that. The, the issue lies with the, the existing roof. Now, if you retain the existing type one sarkin felt, it's going to need ventilating, i.e. in this particular case, 25,000 square millimeters a meter at the soffit, 5,000 at the ridge. And, 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 that's, and that, 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 would, that would deal with with that particular situation. Now, the other alternative that you've got, and especially if you're doing this arrangement, this arrangement where the flat roof and the pitched roof join, I can't, I've never seen anything that ventilates that position well with that particular construction. 
Um, I've seen somebody have a go at it where they projected this flat roof through and effectively formed a soffit here. Um, but theoretically that, that falls inside the profile of the roof and it wouldn't go into LDC. It would, it would, it would need planning permission as far as uh, consent concerned. So I've seen that, but if you want that, 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 that floor of flat roof to pitched roof where effectively you'll place lead in between um, layers one and two of your, of your flat roof and then dress it over the tiles. If you want that type of arrangement, then I don't think you've got any choice but to strip this existing roof of the, of the, of the, um, of the uh, the type the, the type one F sarkin um, membrane and replace it with a breathable membrane in accordance with the the BBA certificate, which which of course will also mean that you're going to have to form a vapor barrier there. And a good place to do that is taping the lower level of your PIR insulation. Uh, there's all sorts of variations of insulating this particular area, but to me. The, the 100 millimetres of PIR between and the 40 millimetres of PIR under, which is taped, is as good as you're going to get, especially if you put a breathable membrane over the top. Now, what it doesn't tend to bother the contract. My experience is, is it hasn't bothered the contractors too much. And the reason why is, is because a lot of the time this roof here has a couple of roof lights in, whether the 308 Veluxes, which is 780 wide, or whether there's a couple of 808s in there, which is 1340 wide. It's a substantial amount of roof. So by the time they've ripped it all, by the time they've, they've put the trimming in and ripped it all to bits, um, taking the whole, stripping the whole roof off and replacing it with a breathable membrane um, doesn't seem to, hasn't bothered them before in the past, but it's something that need, they need to be aware of you know, in, in the early stages of the, of, you know, when they're actually tendering for the job rather than figuring it out when somebody like myself turns up and saying, well, how the hell are you going to actually ventilate this space um, with, the, with the arrangements that you've got? So if you, if you have the warm deck, you seal the soffit there, you seal the soffit there, you install the breathable membrane in the corner of the BBA certificate, and that fully complies. Um, da -da -da. I've got, I've got screens all over. Now this is cold deck running from front to back. So if you have a cold deck roof, remember because what I'd said before, if you're going to have a cold deck, you really need to have a bit of a ridge in there. If you can't have the ridge, then you're going to have to go back. In my opinion, you've got to go back and use the warm deck and the breathable membrane. But if there's sufficient headroom to have a little bit of a uh, a ridge in there where uh, a ventilated ridge system will work, then this is going to work really fine. Sorry, I'll go at the top one first. So in this particular case, we have 25, we have a 25 mil gap at the soffit, which is generally a 65 millimeter um, um, slotted um, uh, soffit um, strip. And then we have 5,000 square millimeters per meter at the ridge provided by a, 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 a typical dry uh, dry fixed ridge system, you know, that's ventilated. And then 25 square, uh, 25,000 square millimetres, the equivalent of, of, a, of a 25 millimetre gap at the, at the soffit. That can cause quite a few problems um, because sometimes that soffit's tight against the, tight against the, uh, the wall and it needs a little bit of forethought. And like I said before earlier, that you know, if you start putting um, ventilated ridge tiles in there, you're virtually going to need four per, per metre to make the thing work. And I think that they're, they're, they're quite expensive to begin with. So it, it's something that needs to be it's something that needs to be checked out. And like I said, the relationship between the structure and the condensation control, i.e. the ventilation, is really whether you need this kind of arrangement or whether if we go back, we, you, you know, you've, you've got that. And of course, the big problem is these days is, is all the decent lofts have been converted. And, and now what we're left with are lofts that, you know, 10, 15 years ago wouldn't have even been considered. And, and, um, and um, um, headroom, you know, headroom is, is much more of, a, of an issue now than, it, than it's ever been. So that was 
So that's basically how you can deal how you can deal with those two particular situations. There is another third way that you could possibly deal with it, and that's where the cold deck roof, instead of um, instead of being ventilated uh, front to back, you ventilate it side to side. So you have ventilated soffits at the um, at the, at the um, at the extremities at the at the dormer cheeks. So under those circumstances, you would still seal that soffit. If the um, existing roof felt is being retained, then uh, and if it's a one type one F, you never know, you might end up converting a loft, a recent loft that actually has a breathable membrane on it, um, in which case you wouldn't have to replace it. But we're not, we're not talking about the one F felt, I'm talking about the old style Sarkin felts. Um, and in this particular situation, you would still have to ventilate top and bottom because you've still kept the, 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 um, the type one F Sarkin felt. Now, if we go down, under this particular diagram, we now again we're going to we're going to ventilate the flat roof side to side, but here we're going to strip the roof off again, the, the, the front roof, and we're going to replace that with a breathable membrane. Or if you're extremely lucky and not many people are, you will your existing roof will have a breathable membrane. Then this part of the roof is dealt with. Remember, we still need to tape the joints on the inside of the, the cellotex there and form a vapor barrier. That side's dealt with, and this side's dealt with. So under those circumstances, you could have a cold deck flat roof. The big, the big issue with the cold deck flat roofs, and I'm just wondering if I can flick back to that. The big issue with, the, with, with cold deck flat roofs is, is um, um, down lighters and and place and, and of course what what's tended to happen in over the over the years is they just bang big holes in there you no insulation and there's a and there's a, a down lighter in there and the, just effectively it looks if Al Capone's shot through the roof um, and and the roof is just peppered with cold bridges um, the lighting systems that you get now don't have don't produce anywhere near the amount of heat. Certainly the LEDs don't produce anywhere near the amount of heat. And you will be able to form little bridges of insulation over the top of them. Um, but the, the best way to, to deal with um, LED light, any form of recess lighting in a flat roof is to, is to have a warm deck on it. You know, if in the warm deck, you can, it doesn't make no difference. So the nice thing about the warm deck, it makes the LED lighting situation disappear and you don't have to faff about you know, with some complex, um, some complex uh, details to to ensure that the, the roof insulation is maintained, and that more or less sums up the um, that sums up the condensation control. Um, and back to you, Trev. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, Let's uh, just get script there sharing again. Share. Okay, should be good to go on uh, part K. I, I see there's a lot of good good um, discourse going on on the on the chat section, and I tried because we're not going to get much time for questions at the end because we we're, we're running over a bit. Um, I've tried to throw in some answers to that. Um, the question about smoke seals, are they required? Well, that's only two doors into garages. And also a question about, um, shouldn't uh, cooking facilities be separated where you've got open plan power floors and, you, and you've got, um, uh, yeah, and you've got open, open plan ground floors and with, with kitchen facilities in them um, and, and sprinklers are provided as a compensation. Um, the answer there, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we've got a few experts in the audience there that may may want to comment. But uh, my my view is that sprinklers and mist systems can can well contain and suppress fires in in kitchens. And why why would we not worry? Why would we deal with them separately? You know, as long as they're covered by the system, I don't think I'd lose any sleep. But uh, always open to debate on that. Anyway, 
as I say, we're on the roll in now. I'm just going to do a very brief set on Park K because stairs often come up uh, in loft conversions. Les has, has talked about some of the anomalies and, and uh, difficulties in, in um, shoehorning stairs into buildings. I'm going to talk more about the regulatory side of things. So here we go. With stairs, a retractable ladder is not permitted uh, as a means of access. So we probably know that uh, for a loft conversion. That's fine if you just want to get up there and um, put a few suitcases on a couple of boards in the loft, but not if, not if it's a room, and that's even if it's a storeroom. Um, that's still a loft conversion, let's not forget. The fact that it's not used for sleeping in doesn't mean it's not a loft conversion. So the standard uh, four types that can be considered are a traditional standard staircase, spiral staircase, an alternating tread or space saver as they're called, staircase, or uh, in rare circumstances, a fixed ladder. And the last two types um, mentioned there are only acceptable when you're serving a single room, or it might be a room and a bathroom, uh, where it isn't possible to create sufficient space for a proper standard stair or a spiral stair. Now that's always a moot point where who's to say if there's sufficient space or not, you know, it might be sufficient space because they want a bigger bedroom. Well, is that a reason to put a, a space saver in? I don't know. We're, that's a debate we'll have another day. Um, the, the pitch or steepness of the stairs and the, and the dimensions of, of the steps and, and illustration and everything, of course, has to comply with the normal requirements of uh, approved document K. Uh, and in there, there's a separate section on alternating stairs to refer to. So we've got, as we know, we've got the risers should be between 150 and 220 millimetres, goings minimum 220. They must be equal for the whole um, flight, maximum 42 degree pitch, of course. And we've got this rule of thumb, twice the rise plus the going should be between 550 and 700. In terms of the headroom, we usually look for a two metres headroom over the new stair for the full flight. A bit more on that later, because as some of you know, that there's, there's a few little uh, pragmatic solutions if there's head, headroom problems. And don't forget to consider the headroom above landing areas as well, um, not just the stair itself. The landing zone extends um, beyond the top rise by the same dimension as the width of the stair. So if that's an 800 mil stair, then that landing will extend for 800 millimetres through there. And you still need to consider headroom in that zone as well. It doesn't end at the top riser. A common compliance issue is inadequate landing headroom um, on a top landing where the, the ceiling is coming down like that. And you might have two metres at that point but as the ceiling comes back down, you don't have it. And that's particularly hazardous um, as, you, as you go up a stair. Uh, we, we don't want any doors opening over that top landing area, um, apart from as in the diagram, a cupboard. And that's only if there remains a clear zone of 400 millimetres beyond the arc of the doors. And that 400 millimetre rule, as you probably know, also applies to doors that swing across the um, landing at the bottom of the stair. Now we're often asked what's the minimum, another critical dimension, what's the minimum width of a stair in a house under the building regulations? Where's that written down? Well, it used to be written down and it's not anymore, but most of us have sort of come to those old rules as being a sensible and applicable uh, in terms of safety. So most local authorities will accept a reduced stair width of 600 millimetres uh, where, where the, it is only giving access to one or two new bedrooms. So here's the, here's the trade-off where we can, or not trade-off, the compromise where we can allow reduced headroom for loft conversion specifically, where you're under a sloping ceiling, uh, as in the diagram, you can accept 1.8 to the edge of the stair, as long as you've got 1.9 at the center of the stair. <clears throat> and they've got a photo there, one of our surveyors, and that's uh, take a, a, a photo of Craig there measuring up a non-compliant arrangement that was on a reversion job where the, the doorway was sighting right on the landing uh, and had grossly inadequate headroom as it turned out so uh, that had to be altered. 
There's an interesting one that some of you might not be aware of. In situations where it's impracticable to install an AD approved document K compliant standard stair in a loft conversion, a designer does have an option to follow the guidance for limited access stairs, which is in a little known British standard, uh, 5395 part four, 2011. And I can imagine there's a few people scribbling that down as I speak. And this permits steeper pitches of up to 50 degrees and uh, smaller going dimensions, um, although that trades off against uh, a more onerous requirements for needing two handrails and also for needing a stair gate at the top and bottom of the stair in the interests of the safety of very young children. There's also relaxed rules for headroom, as you can see in the, in the diagram there. Um, in that situation we, I mentioned at the top of the stair, so you can uh, you can get by with a, a 1.9 at the centre of the landing and uh, 1.8 at the far edge of the landing. So that gives you a bit of wriggle room. When we when building control look at stairs and we apply the regulations related to stairs, um, we sometimes get criticised for inflexibility um, when it comes to matters of compliance. But of course. We have to bear in mind that they're for all users. And these people might be young and fit, old and incapacitated. They might be drunk or sober. In the case of Ed's rider, they might be old, incapacitated and drunk. But, you know, choking apart, um, we, there are over 500 fatal accidents on stairs every year. So if someone's going to fall and injure themselves, on a stair that does not mean meet the laid down national standards, then you know we could be brought to book, and and so could a designer. So it's well worth having a, a standard to hang your hat on, whether that be the the um, limited access stair standard. So you can show that you know you're properly diligent in designing that building, and in our case, approving that design. Well, sorry. Thank you.